All right, welcome everybody. Excited to be back. I am Chad Harris with True Wealth Investors and I am joined today by Arthur Solomon of the Solomon Group and Tim Brotz of Le Legacy Wealth Holdings. And uh, welcome guys, glad to have you. Yeah, I'm excited to be here, man. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much, Chad. And Tim, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So Tim, I know, you know, your story now, you are a hugely successful investor and uh, have thousands of units help other investors uh, with their businesses. Can you walk us through what was the start? Was this a 30 year <laughs> process? Was this? Yeah, I mean, hey, it, uh, yeah. It, I mean, I mean, here's the thing. Like I, you know, go, growing up, I always knew that, um, I was like money motivated. I just, I liked, I liked the idea, you know, for, for very surface level um, type, type reasons before. And then, you know, all of a sudden uh, some of that stuff gets taken care of. And all of a sudden uh, it's not necessarily about the money anymore, but that was a big driver for me early on. And so when I was going through high school and college, I wanted to become a doctor. And then I really liked the, the business side of things. And, um, and then when I was going through college, Oh, three to Oh seven, was uh, the market, real estate market was just going crazy and everybody's making money in real estate. And I was like, hey, maybe I'll jump into real estate. So I like construction, uh, had a painting company um, in college. I had, uh, we did some landscaping types of stuff too, minimally. And then um, and I worked for a big home builder. And then after college, I graduated, moved out to New York City. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio originally and uh, got a real estate license. I thought that's how you, you got involved in real estate get your license, you go and broker stuff, and then eventually that turns into whatever. And so I, I got my real estate license and um, uh, I, I parked it with a commercial brokerage. I ended up leasing retail and office space and leased a big deal. It actually was a small deal, but the landlord made a lot of money on it. Um, and I was like, whoa, like the residual income this guy's going to make is $2 million over the next 12 years for something he did one time. And that doesn't include all the other retail spaces and all the apartments above it and everything else. And I remember just thinking like, I'm, I'm on the wrong side of the coin. I'd be owning real estate, not, not brokering it. And so, you know, moved out to Charleston, South Carolina for some better quality of life. And this is in 08 and uh, go through the whole analysis paralysis phase that I think a lot of people go through. They got to learn everything before they do anything. And uh, I would not say that's the best way to do it. Obviously, you know, you want to learn enough. Uh, but you got to take action as soon as possible. Like it's, uh, you know, I, I liken it to my daughter, you know, learning how to swim. I can tell her about, about swimming nonstop uh, but until she gets in the water, right? Like you got to actually do the activity. You got to do the action and then you learn from doing the action. And um, real estate's the same way. You got to just go buy a property, go buy a property. You're going to learn more from that first property than you ever would by attending seminars or reading about it in a book. Uh, just go take action on it. And so, um, that's what I ended up doing. Like, like the market, uh, well, I, I was analyzing deals and then all of a sudden the market collapsed. Everybody's running from real estate and at the end of 2008. And um, I was like, damn, I just showed up to the party and everybody's running out the back door. And I'm <laughs> like, I, I gotta, like now, now there's nobody lending money on real estate. No, nobody's lending money. Nobody's lending money on real estate. Nobody's lending money to a, a 23 year old kid and nobody's lending money to somebody who's never done a deal before. Right. So like I got a lot of things working against me at that time. And, uh, uh, I ended up getting my credit card limit increased. And I bought the cheapest house on the entire MLS in like, I think it was March, April of, uh, of 2009 and ended up buying it, personally fixing it all up. I did all the work physically to it and uh, knocked on doors and held an open house and sold the house to one of the, uh, one of the neighbors. And it was like 110 days total turnaround time. I made like $13,000 on it. And I was like, dude, this is the worst economy ever. This is the worst housing market ever. And I just made 13 G's on the first deal I've ever done. I was like, this is easy, right? So you know, learning how to wholesale real estate. And then I, I started accumulating a small portfolio of just hood properties. And I personally managed them. I did all the work on them and um, you know, raised private money or I got somebody to co-sign on loans or whatever I had to do in order to get those deals done. And uh, um, had 10 properties at the age of 25, 10 units. And um, I wasn't rich, but I was financially free. My monthly income exceeded my monthly expenses. And um, I was doing the work, but the residual was there and um, it covered my entire lifestyle. And so I was like, oh man, I got this thing figured out. And, you know, then you ch start chasing some shiny objects. And I went down a path of uh, trying new businesses, went totally broke in 2012, got out of that, got back into real estate. 
and um, just kind of put my head down since then. I bought my first apartment building at, at the end of um, 2012, and I really like the scale that, that it came with and uh, going to one location instead of eight locations, negotiating with one seller instead of eight sellers, you know, like um, uh, just uh, renovating one property instead of eight different properties all around town. And so because of that, I really started focusing on the apartment buildings and, um, and just kind of um, put my head down. Didn't look left, didn't look right. Built a portfolio of about 140 units over the next few years. And, um, and then that partnership, I had some exclusive partners in, partners in that company. We ended up going separate ways. So I had to liquidate everything. So I'm like, damn it, I'm going to press the reset button again. And uh, so I'm getting rolling again. And it was really actually a setup because it allowed me to get into different business partnerships. I learned during that original um, phase, but then that's what really allowed me to kind of take off. I joined a mastermind and I had some experience under my belt. And like those two things really helped me um, elevate and escalate my, uh, my lifestyle, my business. So, uh, you know, today I have 4,288 units, uh, about $335 million portfolio value. Uh, we owe probably around 215, 215 million on it to debt and, uh, you know, lenders and equity investors. So we've built a lot of equity in the past five years, not all mine, but it's um, a big chunk of it is. So, um, yeah, man, now, now we just, just, you know, I think we're always evolving. We're always refining, you know, like even though I'm in a certain spot, it's not where I want to be. Um, some of the properties that got me to where I am, I'm actually in the process of selling. They serve their purpose, but now I'm focused on a little bit different type of an asset, uh, a little bit different type of an area. And um, uh, so, you know, I'm kind of taking a step back right now, actually selling a big chunk of my portfolio in order to make several leaps forward. And, um, and I think that's something that we all, we always should be doing and paying attention to and not just doing the activities, but like, you know, sitting back and thinking about what do you want this business to look like? How do you want it to serve you instead of serving it and, um, and more working on the business than just in the business, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. And that's really encouraging too, that, you know, it was, you had one business model in mind and you were doing a lot of the work and single families and then mm -hmm. you switched to businesses and then switched to apartments and um, it wasn't all figured out from day one. So just, <laughs> It sounds like you just kept moving forward and kept trying to get better. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where like I knew real estate wasn't an experiment. I knew it wasn't like some get rich quick. I knew that it would eventually work. Uh, just what was the timing going to be for me? How long would it take for, to, for it to work for me? And um, uh, I knew that you could amass a lot of wealth. I knew that it was the, you know, the number one way that people create wealth and preserve wealth. And so again, I, I knew it would work out. It was just a matter of time. And, um, uh, you know, you, you test out some different things and you chase some shiny objects. And even like, even though I learned my lesson in chasing shiny objects and going broke in 2012, you know, in real estate, you're like, oh, hey, uh, uh, you know, there's rentals and there's flips and there's wholesaling and there's vacation short-term Airbnbs and there's uh, apartments and there's uh, office and there's retail and self-storage. And like, Dude, each one of those is its own business. It's its own silo. And every time you get into a new silo, dude, there's a learning curve that comes with it. I've, I've, I've gotten in multiple speculative land plays and every single time I get my ass handed to me. I don't lose money, but it takes way longer and we had to break it even instead of making millions of dollars that we thought we were going to do. And so I'm like, why? Like, I sent a message over to my, one of my partners. I was like, dude, dude, print this out and frame it for me. And it was all caps, no more speculative land plays. Like we'll never do another <laughs> speculative land play ever, ever, ever again. Uh, every single time, dude, it just, it backfires. And it's because it's not my expertise, right? I've spent my entire life understanding residential uh, real estate and apartment buildings. And dude, it's so dialed in that you cannot, you can't trick me. Like a seller cannot trick me. Like I know how to mitigate 100% of the risk. Um, even to the point where I've had sellers uh, just fraudulently lie and, and misrepresent on deals. And because it's happened to me before, I, I now have it in my purchase agreements that, hey, guess what? You're not allowed to misrepresent. You're not allowed to lie to me. You're, you're not allowed to defraud me. Otherwise, you know, um, there's some sort of retribution type thing. And so like, it's all happened to me. And to the point where like, we have so many different safety nets in place where dude, as you get, you do more and more deals, it becomes less and less risky because you know 
how to do the deals. And it becomes more and more profitable because you're not making the learning mistakes that you made earlier on. So mm-hmm. it, the hardest part is just getting it off the ground and getting that plane up into the air. And then once it's up here, dude, now, now it's, it's the wind stream and everything else takes, takes its place. You just got to put a little bit of gas on once in a while, but you make way more money. You lose way less money. It's a lot more fun uh, because of those things. But then it also gets a little bit boring for guys like us that like to grow businesses and uh, be excited about uh, new, new type things. You're like, oh man, it's just like the same thing over and over again. And, uh, uh, but I, I promise you the guys that I know in business, the entrepreneurs who have just the boring ass mundane doing the same thing day in and day out da, 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 over and over, they print money. They are the wealthiest people that I know because it's just, they become such experts in whatever their niche is. And uh, that's kind of where we are with apartments. So now somebody brings me, I just got a speculative land play <laughs> as I was waiting to hop on this with you guys on um, over like 1300 acres, like, I don't know, 20 minutes from, from where I'm coming to you guys from right now in a great area, but it's a speculative land play. I'm like, I'm not doing it. No, not, not doing it. So, um, you know, it's, it's uh, you got to stay inside your zone, right? And stay, understand what you're, what you're good at and understand what you're not good at and just stay in your lane. And then um, if you want to get into something else, you partner up with an expert in whatever that industry is. So like I do a little bit of self-storage, but that's because I partner up with people who are experts in self-storage. I bring money, I'll sign on the loans, I'll help out with some of the management side of things. But um, dude, staying in your lane is such an important uh, lesson that I've learned over the years. Sure. So do you have a question, Arthur? I've got a lot of questions. Oh, I man, just want to keep, keep it as brief as possible. <laughs> but um, so you're starting out. So you, it's just you doing all the work. And it just rem- reminds me of how I got started, too, and working in the business and not on the business. So mm-hmm. what does your team look like today? Take us to 2021. What, like, how far have you been able to build your team up? And what does your team look like today? Yeah, man, I think, um, you know, early on, I remember I was a solopreneur. I was doing 100% of the work, dude. I'd find the deals. I'd negotiate the deals. I'd raise the money on the deals. I'd oversee the contractor. Sometimes I was actually swinging the hammer and doing the work on the properties. I was doing property management, rent collection, banking, accounting, bookkeeping, sales, disposition. Like, dude, everything is what I was handling before. And, um, and I remember seeing these big businesses. I'm like, how the hell do you go from solo guy to, to having hundreds of employees or dozens right. of employees or thousands of it? Like, like there's got to be a step. I, I, I don't know. Like, what is the missing link? I did not understand what that looked like. And, um, you know, t- uh, go there. All right. So today I have almost 200 employees, right. In a span of five wow. years and, um, sounds like a lot and technically it is right. But every single property is kind of like its own silo, its own business. Meaning, uh, for every hundred units I own, I have about one onsite property manager and I have uh, two maintenance guys. And then there's like a leasing agent. So there's about four employees for every hundred units that I own. Um, you know, sometimes there's more maintenance per- persons, but sometimes there's less leasing agents or whatever. It just kind of depends on the size of the, of the project itself. But I own 4,300 units. So that puts me at 170 employees right there approximately. And then I have like my investment team and I have some joint venture partners and stuff like that. So my core investment team is only about 10 of us. Um, and I have some, some employees that we, we manage in-house property management and some stuff's up in Cleveland area, but, uh, really our core investment team is probably like six of us. And then there's a couple ancillary type, uh, individuals who help out with our, um, property management. And then we have the education side that has a, a few employees on it as well. Um, but like, how do you do that? How do you go from one to 200? And it was, it was plugging into a mastermind. I went to a mastermind in, in February of 2015. And I, I asked that exact question that, that uh, we're talking about right here is like, how do you go from here? And I'm just banging my head against the wall. I'm doing all the work. I can't figure this thing out. And um, I, I need help, but I just don't know how to do it because I'm so in the weeds and I can't see uh, the big picture, right? And so like, you need to go to a mastermind so somebody can come in from a different level, a different perspective and be like, not emotional perspective and say, Hey, here's exactly what you need. Here's what I did in that situation. Here's what I did that I shouldn't have done in that situation. And it fast tracks your success because you're able to lean on other people's experiences. And um, it was pretty easy. They're like, Hey, you just got to get all the non-revenue generating activities off your plate. I said, what does that mean? Well, you need to focus Tim on the stuff that makes money, 
you know, and by generating revenue, revenue solves all problems. So you just need to focus on generating revenue, take all the non-revenue stuff off your plate, either eliminate it or delegate it out. And uh, I was like, well, what do I, what do I, what do you mean? Like, who do I hire? Like, you got to hire an assistant. I was like, well, that's going to cost me 35 grand a year. Like, no, it's going to cost you three grand a month. You know, if it doesn't work for two months, you risk $6,000 and you go back to hating your life again, banging your head against the wall. And I was like, damn, that's a different way of looking at it, you know? And so I went and hired, you know, a, uh, um, an assistant in March, March 1st of 2015. And, um, yeah, March 1st, 2015. And, uh, the next 10 months, dude, I tripled my income of what I made the previous year. Uh, now, you know, you, you go through like every level that you get to, there's another level of problems that comes with it. My next level of problems was every time there was a problem, I was like, just hire somebody for it, right? Just give it to somebody else. And I brought on so many employees that it ended up, you realize most businesses go out of business because of lack of cash flow. Number one reason for lack of cash flow is for having too much overhead. Number one reason for having too much overhead is too many employees. And so I had all these employees and all of a sudden, like, dude, the cash flow started dropping significantly. I was like, ah, I had to, you know, um, kind of backtrack a little bit. So uh, learn my lesson there. And, you know, dude, I think everything you go through is, is a learning lesson and you just keep on refining and refining and refining. And then all of a sudden you get kind of to a level where you understand some of the basic business elements of, of building a team, of operations, of systems, of human resources, of uh, the finance and the accounting and the sales and the marketing. And, and you get to a certain, at least in your industry, you understand those things. And um, it just, I don't know, kind of like clicks. It kind of becomes easier because you've been through it so many times. You messed up so many times, you know, exactly what to do, what to say, who to hire. Um, it's, it, it's wisdom, right? It's not that I'm smart. I've just done a lot of deals and I've done a lot of deals for a long time. And so I, so much experience that experience lends then wisdom and you can um make better decisions as you continue to grow and then as you grow bigger you know it becomes more profitable and and you lose less money because you understand how to do the deals sure so you mentioned the mastermind so if someone wanted to be a part of your mastermind that, that you've got now the real estate education mastermind how could they get more information on that yeah i appreciate that dude i uh and that's obviously not why i'm i'm here is to plug it but i know you're um uh, uh, you're a huge value, value driver. So, uh, no, I mean, I like, listen, whether it's my mastermind or somebody else's mastermind, or you start your own mastermind, I truly believe that they are the best investment you can possibly make. If you got 25 grand in your bank account, I wouldn't go and buy a property with it. I would go join a mastermind because by joining a mastermind, you're going to be able to meet people and raise more money. You're going to be able to source more deals. You have essentially an executive board to bounce ideas and questions and hurdles and struggles off of. They're going to be able to, uh, um, give you quantum leaps forward in your business. And it's, it's a $25,000. It's an investment, right? Education is an investment. Um, you see a return on that investment. So, uh, you know, that first year, dude, I, I spent $30,000 on a mastermind, but I made $400,000 uh, from what I learned in that mastermind. And the relationships set me up with so much private money that helped me get to 400 apartment doors. My first 400 units came from private money. And in those groups that are or people that were introduced to me from people in those groups. And so I, I'm a huge believer in masterminds and I'm part of five masterminds and I run another two on top of it. That's how much I believe in these things. And uh, so my, my masterminds legacy boardroom, and it's really like the technical elements of how to invest in, in apartments. It's uh, how to source deals, how to uh, raise capital, how to structure the financing, how to build out a team, uh, the operations, project management, property management, asset management, and then a lot of the visionary type uh, type things as well of like making sure that you're working on the business instead of in the business and, and things along those lines. So it's, a, it's an awesome, awesome mastermind. It's an awesome group of people. Everybody's doing high level stuff and um, making some big, big impact. So uh, yeah, just, I don't know, hit me up on social media and I'll, I'll kick you guys the, the link for that. But, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty cool, it's a pretty cool group. That's fantastic. Well, as far as mind frame, man, you talk about 4,228 units, I think you said yep. <laughs> that's a special kind of a mind frame. Like some people just get comfortable. They're like, well, I got 50 units or I got a hundred units. Like, what is your mind frame? Like, what, what do you do to like prime yourself on a daily basis to be, to remind yourself, like, I got to keep going. I got to keep grinding. I got to keep adding value. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think a lot of people they're focused on the money initially and that's okay. Like, I don't think that's shallow at all. I think a lot of people, you know, say, Oh, it's not about the money. Well, dude, early on, it, it was about the money. It was about putting the food on the table and putting a, right. a nice roof over our heads and, you know, putting clothes on our back. And dude, I, it's not about the money itself, but it's what can the money can do, right? Like what's the impact it can make? How many lives can you change and how much uh, um, uh, help can you, can you provide? And um, it's like, that's the noble part. You cannot go and, and build villages for, for um, underprivileged people if you don't have any money, right? Like it's, an, it's a driving economic factor. Like you have to have access to capital. So uh, as long as you're using it, for good and you're doing the right things with it and you're not just hoarding it. Like, I think it's um, a really, really powerful uh, thought process on that. So like, I remember early on, it's like, uh, once you're, uh, for me, it was, it's a lot about money and making sure that bills are paid and all that stuff. But I remember watching a documentary that was talking about like happiness and level of happiness. And it was like, um, it, once you hit a certain threshold and you, and your basic needs are met, you know, roof over your head, food on the table, clothes on your back, live in a safe neighborhood. You're not worried about the safety and security of your family. Um, and for most people, it's around 70, 50 to $75,000 a year uh, in household income. Um, after beyond that, there's no difference in level of happiness, whether you make $50,000 a year or $50 million a year. I know I, I remember hearing that. I was like, well, I want to try it out anyways. Like, like let, let, let me be the decision maker on that. And, uh, but I will tell you, like, I make a lot more money now than I did when I, when I saw that video, whatever it was six years ago. And um, uh, my happiness level didn't increase because of the money. My happiness level has increased. And I wouldn't even, I don't know if it's necessarily increased, but the fulfillment level that I feel has increased because of the money of what the money can do and how much I can give back. And, uh, you know, like uh, helping out family, helping out friends, helping out other people, being able to educate them and let them know that the circumstance that they're in doesn't have to continue to be the same circumstance. They can do different things and they can get into deals and they can build wealth for their family and change their family financial tree forever. And, um, like that's what, what gives me more fulfillment now. So the driving factor for me today, uh, really on the education side is like, how much can I help? Right. And then all of a sudden I build up this team and you almost have, have an obligation to make sure that you keep on building the business because there's a lot of families that rely on it now. Um, so that's a part of it, but there's always been something inside of me, man, that just kind of like is a, is a just burning fire, burning desire to, to make big things happen. And I mean, you can ask anybody from even when I was in like high school or something. Um, I like to do, I like to have big parties. I like to have like do fun stuff. I like to be kind of, kind of get some of the attention type of thing. And so I like the idea, I, I just like building businesses. And I, I like the idea of pushing limits and seeing how big I can build it. I like the idea of um, I don't know, what do, what the hell else am I going to do? Right. Like when we just sit on the friggin' beach all day, like that sounds cool in theory for a week or two, but like <laughs> guys like us who are out there grinding and working and, and they get more fulfillment from the achievement and the pursuit of achievement than they do from the actual reward itself. Like I'm never going to sit back, dude. I know you guys would never sit back. Like it's cool to do that for a month, you know, but like, I would go stir crazy if I was just sitting on a beach all day, every single day. I got to, I have to see the growth. I have to see the impact. I have to see the difference that I'm making. And that's, that's just the driving factor. I think, um, you know, I, I saw, you guys ever heard of Gino Wickman? Oh, yeah. he's, he's the guy who wrote Traction. Yeah. Um, that was in our got, mastermind, like what, a month ago, we, we went through the book Yep. and get a yeah. grip and traction. Yeah. And so, um, I saw something where he was talking about like are entrepreneurs born or entrepreneurs made. And um, he believes entrepreneurs are born, you know, which is kind of like disheartening a little bit, you know? Um, and, and I thought about that. And, and, and by the way, dude, like everything that you guys consume, including stuff that you guys hear from me, you should question all of it, right? You could say, Hey, I agree with that or I disagree with that. Or like, why, why are they thinking that way? What kind of circumstances have they been through that would put them in that sort of like, I'm a very, uh, reflective, I guess, person. And I try to like, think about why people are pursuing different opportunities or whatever, why they're saying different things. And I remember thinking about him saying that. And I, I, I don't totally agree, but I, I don't totally disagree with it. I actually think 
anybody could be an entrepreneur and build a business up to a few million dollars a year in gross revenue. I think anybody can do it. I think there's some basic principles um, where you can build a business and make, you know, several hundred thousand dollars a year up to a couple million dollars a year and do gross revenue up to maybe like 10 million bucks a year. I think almost anybody can do that. Um, where I think there's a, and I think that person can be made, right? I think that person can be learned and taught and, and start their own business that way. Where I think there's a difference is is building a $100 million business or a billion dollar business or an Elon Musk type of a person who, like Elon Musk became the richest person in the country uh, beyond Bezos a couple of weeks ago. You know what he posted on social media? That's cool. Back to work. Back to work. <laughs> that's, that's what he said. And, and like, it's the same thing. Like, I, it doesn't matter if I got 10,000 units or 100,000 units or uh, whatever. Like, I'm still going to be out there pushing the limits. I don't know if it's going to be always in real estate. Maybe it's in, maybe I open up an investment fund. Maybe I uh, open up a, a, a nonprofit. Maybe I go on a giving spree and I go and build libraries like Andrew Carnegie did. You know, like, I don't know, but I'm going to be pushing in some way all the time. And, um, and I think that's kind of like an internal factor that you're just driven with, like you're just born with maybe. Um, I think some of those kinds of people are, are just, they're just different, you know? Um, and, and, and dude, sometimes it's aggravating as hell. Sometimes I just want to relax <laughs> and sit back and not deal with this shit. But I've designed my life in a way where I can, you know, go and take a day off or take three days off or take two weeks or two months or five months off if I wanted to, because uh, I've built the business that way. But um, I can tell you, man, when I go on vacation for over a week or two, it's like, I can't wait to get back into the office and just kind of um, get back into the groove of things. So it's, uh, uh, it's kind of a long answer to what your question was, but hopefully it helps. That's awesome, man. I know we're running short on time, Tim. We definitely appreciate you having on and we'd love no, to have I'm, you on I'm again good, in the man. future. I got, a, I got a couple more minutes. So um, I just, my wife just came in. So we got some extra time. All right. right. Sure. So if you guys have got a couple extra questions, I'm, I'm happy to hang out and, and answer them. I know I've been a little bit long winded on some of these. No, a lot of great info. I know for a lot of people, when you talk about, you know, even once you switch to apartments and you had 120, 140 units, and you liquidated that, and suddenly you're jumping to 4,000 units. A lot of people kind of, I know, struggle with what was the linchpin? You know, what suddenly made the jump? And I know it was networking and information and those relationships, but looking at the, the business aspect of it, was there one part that you focused on? Like, was funding the issue? Was yeah, I, 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 I realized what the revenue generating activities were. You know, before I was doing whatever, you know, I'd, I'd you know, make business cards. I'd work on a website. I'd work on a, a CRM system. I'd put fancy spreadsheets together for no reason. I'd uh, organize stuff. I'd, you know, like that's not doing business, right? Like that's just busy work. That doesn't mean... Um, activity does not equal productivity, right? And so uh, I wasn't being productive and I learned how to be productive. And, uh, you know, hard work is, it's overrated, right? Like hard work, everybody thinks I got to go work hard to be successful. Dude, think about Christmas vacation. Christmas vacation, you know, like when they're, when he's, when he's turning on the lights outside <laughs> and the lights don't work and the, the mother-in-law's like, <laughs> what a silly waste of, of, of resources, and the daughter goes, well, he worked really hard, grandma. And the, the father-in-law goes, or the grandpa says, yes, yeah, so do washing machines. And it's like, that was, that was like, it's a comedy thing. But like, I got a lot out of that. I, I actually resonated with me. I was like, you're right. Like everybody works hard. Why aren't janitors rich? You know, why isn't the cleaning lady rich? Why isn't like, because they work harder. Why aren't landscapers super, super wealthy? Um, the guys putting tile around my pool right now, like they've been working their ass off since 730 in the morning and they won't leave until 730 at night. And I'm thinking like hard work is, is, is really a fallacy, dude. It's, it's, it, it's not about just hard work. It's about doing the right things and working hard at doing the right things, the productive activities. And I got, I understood that in real estate, dude, all that matters is finding deals, being able to source really, really good deals and being able to source capital. And then you could take deals down. And then in order to keep deals, you got to be really good at refining operations and constantly looking at how do you increase the income, decrease the expenses on your business. If you're doing those three things, dude, that's all you need to be focused on. And everything else should be either eliminated or staffed out somehow. 
And, um, and that's what I started focusing on. And so that, that would be one of them. I'd, I'd say the other one was joining a mastermind. Every level I got to, there was another level of problems. There's another level of struggle. There was another level of, oh shit, what do I do now? And by going out to a mastermind, I punched through any one of those problems. And because it was something that I can connect back with uh, the group every, every 90 days or so, we meet about four times a year, I was able to then like have a quantum leap forward. And then when the next level of problems hit, guess what? There was another event coming up. And I was able to go through and be like, guys, here's what I'm struggling with now. And it was like, boom, boom, boom. Here's some connections. Here's some resources. Here's what I did. Here's what I wouldn't do. Here's what I, uh, I wish I did. Or, you know, like, and, it, and it, every single time I went, it was like, boom, 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 boom. And I just kept on growing and growing faster and faster. And um, uh, dude, I, I don't think that you have that kind of growth unless you have either a board of directors for your business, which many of us early on cannot afford. Uh, so by joining a mastermind, you have a board of directors for the cost of less than what a personal assistant would cost you, you know? And so people see $30,000 a year as a big chunk of change. And, you know, is it, I don't know. I think you're probably losing 10 times that because you don't have those resources. I think that's more expensive than spending $30,000. Um, and then what, what can you make out of, out of that and the connections you can have? And, uh, uh, the heartache that you don't have to deal with or, uh, you know, the expedition of getting, getting to your goal faster and hitting those financial goals sooner. Um, dude, I think it's a, I think it's pales in comparison to what, what the cost is to get into it. You know? So I think, I think dude, joining a mastermind and focusing on revenue generating activities, those two things, um, are the two most important things that have helped me get to where I am today. That's awesome. That. That's gold right there. Appreciate it. Um, okay, another question for you. The idea of managing 200 people, I'm sure, is uh, unbelievably scary to a lot of <laughs> a lot of people. If you've managed one or two people, I mean, the headaches that can come if that that doesn't go well. What are do you have any tips for how to manage a large organization or or a lot of people? That's a great question, man. Um, and you're right. And a lot of people early on, here's why they don't have big teams is because usually you're really bad at hiring people early on. You hire your friends, you hire unqualified people, you don't do it the proper way. And because of that, you have a lot of headaches with your staff. You have a lot of headaches with uh, training them and you're probably not training them. You're probably not measuring their performance. You're probably not putting roles, responsibilities, and KPIs in place. And so because of that, everybody has a really bad experience early on with hiring people. And they're like, you know what? I don't want a big team. You know, I, I want a small team. And whenever somebody tells me that, I know that they had really awful experiences with employees early on. And, um, and they, it's not that they don't want a big team. They just don't want to manage it. Well, dude, I don't manage all these people. I actually don't manage anybody on my team other than my videographer now. And, um, uh, and that's it, you know, like my COO handles all of it and he doesn't handle all of it. He's got certain people that are managers and, and management companies that manage everything. Um, I'll tell you that like, it's actually easier to build a bigger business with more employees than it is to build a small business with fewer employees. Why? Because I'll, I'll give you an example. I have a uh, hundred unit apartment building on a hundred unit apartment building. I typically have one main, or I'm sorry, one property manager, one leasing agent, and two maintenance personnel. And the leasing agent might be full-time, part-time, depending on the, um, how stable the deal is. So we have four employees. Here's, if the property manager quits, guess what? I, I, now I'm scrambling, right? I'm, I got to go find another property manager. I got to find somebody to fill that gap. Like that's an issue. If I have a 300 unit apartment complex, that 300 unit apartment building has three property managers. If one of them quits, no problem. I got two other ones to fill the gap while we bring in somebody new and train somebody new. It's actually easier to build a bigger business for that reason than it is to build a small business because there's, there's extra, uh, you know, kind of stop losses in place to make sure that, that it, it's heavy management intensive on a, one unit, on a hundred unit building when you only have one employee and that one employee quits. Now I got to go step in or somebody from your team has to go step in. 
Uh, conversely, when you have a big business or a bigger apartment building, you can have multiple people in that same seat. If one person quits or one person needs to get fired, then that's not an issue. You can just loop in somebody else. And um, uh, when you understand that element, it, it, uh, you want to jump through this hell zone, dude. Like zero to a million dollars in gross revenue is, is a proof of concept phase for most businesses. Hey, I, I'm making some money. Great. I can, uh, I, I see that actually works that I can actually do something with this. When you do about a million to about $10 million uh, or a definitely million to five, probably up to around $10 million in most businesses, dude, that is hell zone. And hell zone occurs because um, you're making enough money where you realize you got something, but not enough money where you can bring on a players and pay them multiple six figure salaries. So now you're like, how do I get through this threshold of building my business in a way that um, uh, allows me to punch through hell zone and bring on A players. I've got through that, right? It was a very difficult time, but I punched through that by bringing on joint venture partners where I didn't have to pay them six figure salaries. I gave them equity and deals instead. And that allowed me to then attract A players into my organization and fill those gaps that high you know, C-level executives would fill in most businesses. And, um, and it got me to a point where now we're doing, you know, I don't even know what we bring in. It's like over $20 million a year in, in gross rents and um, not to mention the education business and everything else. So, um, you know, we've got a multiple eight figure business now, and now we're generating enough revenue where we can bring on a players and hire third-party management companies. And that's another thing that you could joint venture with people. You could bring on fra fractional employees. Like my bookkeeper started out, you know, one day a month, then they were one week, uh, or one day a week. And then they were, um, uh, two days a week. And then we just brought them in, in house full time. So you can start out with fractional employees. You can start out with joint venture partners who complement your skill sets. You don't want somebody who has the same skill sets as you, somebody who does opposite of, of what you do. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, and, and then, and then, um, you know, you, you get to a spot where you can give somebody equity, you could pay them fractionally. Um, and then you can kind of grow with them if they're, if they're growth oriented. So that's kind of helped me out with, with growing my team. Um, the other thing is like just contracted employees using a third-party management company, instead of having in-house property management is a way that you can get that thing rolling sooner. You could focus on revenue generating activities, put third-party management in place and you focus on doing more deals. And then all of a sudden you got enough deals where now you can start building out your team. So uh, there's a few different ways to go about it, but you definitely need to get that, um, the non-revenue generating activities off your desk as soon as possible. That's sharp. All right. That's good stuff. It almost sounds counterintuitive. You know, you're growing <laughs> and you're really hitting does. all these growing pains and the solution is to grow more. It is. But yeah. It is. It's like revenue right. solves all problems. So if you stay close to the revenue line, revenue will solve all problems. And you can just keep on pushing through, pushing through, generate more revenue. Like I learned this early on when I um, had that business partnership that, that folded. It actually got really ugly. They lawyered up, I lawyered up, and um, we had the attorneys going to each other's throats for, for a few weeks there. And it was the most stressful time in my life because I was making a little bit of money, but dude, I couldn't lose. I couldn't afford to lose it all. And um, and I'm spending, you know, I spent 10,000 on attorneys the first like week or something. And I'm like, hold, like, I'm going to go broke. And uh, uh, one of my mentors in that mastermind said, dude, go back to making money. Give this to the attorneys. Let the attorneys do what they do best. You go back to making more money. And that's what I ended up doing. I went and just generated more revenue and focused on making more money. And the attorneys went at each other and they realized I wasn't going to back down the other, the other party. And they ended up calling me up and saying, hey, man, the only people getting rich here are going to be the attorneys. Let's just sit down and hash it out ourselves. And I ended up, after two or three weeks, we just sat down ourselves and decided to dissolve and liquidate all the property. And um, I don't do it. If I would have stressed out about it and, and bit, like they would have probably seen signs of weakness and came at my, came at my throat and uh, taken me out. You know, So um, if you just gen generate more revenue, the revenue will pay for whatever those, those uh, resources need to look like. You go back to just making money. You as the entrepreneur, that's your, that's your responsibility. Right on. Uh, Tim, before we wrap it up, what kind of materials, like for our viewers that are maybe thinking about getting started or, you know, obviously you're high level. So we've got a, a you know, widespread of audience in our uh, podcast. So what's the number one book or number one thing? Sounds like it could be the, the one thing or uh, that could be a good uh, 
book that you would recommend, but what book would you recommend if someone's thinking about getting started in real estate and really being an entrepreneur and really taking it to the next level and leveling up? Yeah, dude, I, I think um, the, the reason, one of the, one of the earlier reasons I got big into personal development right when I got out of college, dude, I, I read two books in all of high school and college. <laughs> in all of high school college i read just books. i was anti-reading and then when i got out i started reading a book at, like at least every month and i went through this personal development and then i started watching you know goal cast and i started watching uh ted talks i started learning and, and just i got so inundated i went to the library i remember when i first graduated um from from college and uh it was when the library you know, still had like CDs and all that kind of stuff. And I went and I, and I rented all the Tony Robbins and all the personal development stuff, uh, CDs, and I burned all of them. And then I had them all in my car and I, I lived in New York after college. And then I moved down to Charleston. So whenever I drove back to Ohio to visit my family, I would, I would listen and dude, it was just listen. And now you can listen to podcasts. Now you can listen, you know, to on, on, um, on YouTube and Spotify or whatever, uh, listen to podcasts on, on all that stuff. And, uh, but I would just, dude, I'd always be listening. It was almost like I never listened to music before then. And, and, uh, I just dove deep into personal development and I, I joined a network marketing company. There was a lot of personal development that happened in that company. And I learned how to publicly speak. I learned how to like really set my mindset up. And, um, I think that's one of the things that a lot of people take for granted. They want the technical skills and how to swing the hammer. Like, dude, you need to understand business right? Like the reason Warren Buffett is so successful is because he understands business and he can get into any business because he knows the fundamentals of every single business, uh, the, the human resources, the operations, the finance and accounting, the marketing, the sales side of things, the team building. And so it doesn't matter what widget you're selling or what service you're providing. If you understand business and, and you understand the mindset that it takes to, to be an entrepreneur, um, you, you can jump into anything. Now, there's always a learning curve of learning the technical skills and everything, but um, that was something that I did early on that really, I think, set me up. And I had always a long-term vision. I always had, I understood that, you know, pay attention to the, the long-term goal. It'll help over, overcome the short-term obstacles by doing that. Um, and so a lot of things like that, I learned. So if, if you don't have the mindset built up and you're still hanging out with broke friends, and you are not intentional about who you're hanging out with and intentional about what you're listening to and what you're watching. Um, like that's, that's, I think, number one, it's like, you can add a lot of stuff on, but you also need to subtract a lot of shit. You'll have more growth if you do it that way. Um, so make sure you're reading the right books. Um, you know, I, think and grow rich is one of the classic personal development books, how to win friends and influence people. One of the most influential books that I've ever read. Uh, richest man in Babylon, rich dad, poor dad, uh, um, magic of thinking big power, of positive, positive thinking. Like there's a lot of books, the class look, look up like the best personal development books ever. And there's a list of hundreds of them and focus on the top 10 that you see over and over and over again. And, um, I would definitely jump on, jump on all those books and read all those books. I'd also listen to people like Tony Robbins. I'd listen to, um, you know, I mean, I mean, like, I, I don't agree with a hundred percent of what like Grant Cardone says, but I think he's got some amazing sales strategies. He's a, he's a, one of the best marketers this in this world right now. He's um, he's got a lot of good things that he says. There's not everything. And I don't take everything that any one person says as gospel truth ever. Um, so just, you know, I, I think taking the insights, thinking about it, reflecting on it is, is a big deal. And that's going to make you stronger. Dude, I think the mindset is 80% of it. And then the action and the activity and of making sure you're doing the right actions is the other 20%. Um, so I would definitely dial in the mindset first. It's gold right there, man. That's so much value right there. So much value. I appreciate it. So, all right. So I know that, uh, what you've achieved so far is not the end. You have big things <laughs> that you are moving towards. Um, if somebody wants to, you know, follow you as, as you continue to conquer big things, uh, what's the best way for them to keep in touch with you? Yeah, man, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I think social media is probably the best way to, to connect with me. Um, follow me on, on Instagram, TikTok. Um, I'm active on Facebook, very active on Facebook, always trying to put content out there and, and uh, provide value any way that I can. And so if, um, yeah, if you're not connected on, on Facebook, send me a friend request. Um, Follow me on, on Instagram. I'm, I'm always trying to create 
value any way that I can on, on those mediums. All right. Awesome. Well, really appreciate, appreciate you guys, it. man. Really good questions and appreciate you guys having me. And uh, yeah, if there's ever anything that I can do for you guys too, don't hesitate to reach out. Appreciate it. We'll look forward I think to I'll be reaching out to you about the, the, those apartments. I might have somebody for those apartments trying to like for date. Sounds good, man. Come, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tim. Appreciate right. it. Chad, appreciate always it, guys. Take care. Yeah. Have a great day.